All right, turn in your Bible, your King James Bible. Very important. Don't mess with the Vatican versions that have been messed with, with uh, by the Jesuits and other devil worshipers. Uh, Matthew chapter 25. All right, I had another question here. This is the second uh, question that I had received. Uh, who are the ten virgins? What's going on there in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13? Uh, what's this group all about? Well, first of all, I'm going to read it like a Pentecostal would. Pentecostal Catholic. If you don't understand our humor. Matthew chapter 25. We'll read the verses here, and then I'll put on my little act. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open, and open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know not, or ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right, here's my act. Okay, I'm a Pentecostal, charismatic cuckoo bird. Here's how it works. Okay. Now, friends, we can see here today that this passage is so important because what you need to remember is that if you're not prepared, if you don't have the oil, which is the Holy Spirit, if you are not fully given over to the Holy Spirit, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in another tongue, if you haven't done that, then when the rapture happens, you will be one of the foolish virgins that's left here on the earth. You will find yourself without the Holy Spirit of God to be taught up to be with Him in the air. You will be here for the Great Tribulation time period. What do I have to say about that? Well, uh, you can do it a number of ways. One way would be to go like this, coo 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 coo. Another way would be, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. In other words, it's stupid. That's not what the text is saying. All right? Going to make some points here, okay? Number one, when does the New Testament begin? Go over to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. Read it. Pause the video and go there and read it. Don't sit there looking at the screen, you know, with your mouth open. Uh, uh, stop the video and get your paper King James Bible, not an e-book, not a website. Paper King James Bible. If you have one, if you don't, go to a dollar store. You can get them for cheap. Get the thing and read it. Hebrews 9, verses 15 through 17, to see when the New Testament comes in. It comes in with the death of the testator. Jesus dies on the cross. That cross, that begins the New Testament, not Matthew chapter 1, as I've said many, many times. Okay? You're not reading about the something here for Christians. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove you by, we're going to look at this thing verse by verse. I'm going to show you that this thing cannot be referring to the bride of Christ. All right? It has nothing to do with a Christian. There is no such thing as a split rapture, where if you have enough Holy Spirit oil, then you're in. And if you have not enough Holy Spirit oil, if, you're, if you need to go buy some, you know, then you don't get in. All right? That is a heresy. Definitely. Now let's start out, actually, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 24 to get in proper context here. What's going on? Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, the nation of Israel, about this coming time of Jacob's trouble. That's what he's talking about. He says, there shall be great tribulation. There in, uh, uh, let's see where the verse is. Is it 20, 21? For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. All right. He is not, that is not a title. It's a description. There shall be great tribulation. He doesn't say be the great tribulation. All right. Verse 29 says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Again, it's not a title. It's a description. That's so important because every post-tribber, 
every Roman Catholic that believes that they have to go through the final time of purification, you know, every single one of them always will run. They will always take you to Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. All right? They're heretics, as I've said many, many times. All right? But let's look at verse 42. It says here, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant who is Lord, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant who, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Question. Uh, where was there a mention of faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4? Where is the gospel that we preach today? Faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Uh, well, that's right, because Jesus didn't die on the cross yet. That didn't happen until chapter 27. Where's faith mentioned? You say, well, verse 45. Who then is faithful? A faithful and wise servant. Uh, that's faithful in your works. What's going on in context? Jesus is speaking about the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Did you know that nobody is justified by faith at that point in time? He said, oh, what? 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 I never heard of these things. Well, then it'd be a good thing for you to look up these things in the Bible just to make sure that I'm not lying to you. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Keep your hand there in Matthew 24. But go to Hebrews chapter 11. Well, this is just, this is just heresy. I, I just can't believe it. I'm, I'm taken aback. <laughs> well, look it up. You know, <laughs> I get that thing from people. I've never heard this before. Okay, princess. Uh, is it in the Bible? Are you reading it? Can you read? What does it say? Well, that's your interpretation. I get that, too. That's your interpretation. Okay, then you interpret it. Let's, let's see how difficult this verse is here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Let's see if this is my interpretation. Or just reading, reading plain English. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can we define faith from this passage? Yes. Is faith something that you see? Can you have faith in something that you see? I'll say it that way. <clears throat> no. If you see it, you don't need faith. I mean, do you believe, do you need to believe by faith right now that there are two flags hanging behind me? No. You can see it. This is not a green screen. See? My book's behind there. These are real books. You know? See? Real books. Okay? <laughs> it's not a green screen. This one either. Over here. You don't need faith to believe in the flags. Do we need faith to believe in Jesus Christ right now? Yes. I can't see Jesus Christ. I can't see God. I have to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. You say, well, I thought you said that the book of Hebrews is for the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. It is, early on. But it transitions, you see. Let me show you. Keep your finger still in Matthew chapter 24, because we're going to be coming right back there here very soon. And turn over to the book of Revelation, verse or chapter 10, verse 7. Why is there no faith mentioned in Matthew 24? Because of Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be 
finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. It's no longer going to be a mystery that God exists. So by the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, there are no atheists. The atheists have simply converted to their true calling, and that is satanic, devil-worshipping God-haters. And, you know, and again, oh, it's the one we atheists believe, we don't even believe in the devil. Well, okay, go back and read in the book of Genesis there when Satan says, Yea, hath God said, you know, and he gives Eve, uh, he tells her to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, says ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's what an atheist is. It's exactly what you are. You're a Luciferian if you're an atheist. You believe in the Luciferian doctrine. Simple. You believe that you are your own God and you can discern between good and evil. You don't need a book or some dumb hillbilly preacher like me telling you that you're a sinner because you're too smart, right? You're a Luciferian. Simple. But towards the end there of the time of Jacob's trouble, Revelation 10 verse 7 says, the mystery of God is finished. That's why, turn back to Matthew 24, that's why there, Matthew chapter 24, the last part of the passage there, you have them looking and working, looking for Jesus to come back, but the mystery of God's finished. They're not living by faith anymore. I'm going to prove it to you because that's all of what Matthew chapter 25 is about. So you get a bunch of self-righteous people, they'll try to use Matthew chapter 25 to get you involved in a system of works. You know why? Because if you're involved in a system of works, I can control you. Any guy can control you. Any man out there. Any preacher. If I can get you into a system of thinking that you have to do certain things to be saved and to stay saved, that's the important thing there. Not only do them to get saved, but to stay saved. You have to continue in these works or you're going to be lost. Something's going to happen to you. The rapture is going to happen. You're going to be left because you didn't have the oil. If I can get you into that system of belief, oh boy, I got you. I got control over you. You see? I mean, you better send me 10% of your tithe off the top before taxes or you are not going to have enough oil. You see? <laughs> That's what's going on here. Matthew chapter 25 is pure works. Why? It's at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. There's no more faith because the mystery of God is finished. They're not living by faith. They're, they have to be faithful in terms of continuing to do those good works at the end, which we're going to see in Matthew chapter 25. But there's no faith in, I believe that Jesus, I, I believe I have, I have faith that Jesus exists. The mystery of God is finished. Now let's read Matthew chapter 25 about these ten virgins. And right in the very first line, the whole thing is given away. How do you know? It says here, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. The kingdom of heaven. Keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 24 and go back, back to Matthew chapter 11. Scripture with Scripture. Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You say, the kingdom of heaven is where God dwells. Really? So there's a lot of fighting up in heaven, and violent people take it by force? No. You say, what's the kingdom of heaven? This word in Hebrew says Jerusalem. The city of the great king. This is the flag that they fly over there. This is the official flag of Jerusalem. And again, watch the other videos. It's prophesying the return of the Messiah. Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Right there. It's his city. Interesting that he would control the uh, design of the flag of his city. Don't tell me he didn't. Uh, it's an interesting study. But the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. I guarantee you right now, and I've said this in other studies, if I called somebody up in Jerusalem and said, hey, stick the telephone outside, you'd probably hear sirens, you'd probably hear gunshots, you'd probably hear bombs going off in the distance. They fight over this city all the time, more than any other city on the entire planet. 
Why? Because Matthew chapter 11 said so. Because God's word is right. Back to Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Then, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Did they go to marry him? No. They went forth to meet the bridegroom. The body of Christ marries the bride, the bridegroom, excuse me. We marry Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 19. Read it. Again, we're not going to for sake of time, but read it. If you want to pause this video and go read Matthew chapter 19, or Revelation chapter 19, go ahead. Read it. Okay? And, uh, see, I have the, uh, where's my reference here? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 25. Another very important tie in here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, further proof that this has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 says, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think... No, that's not at the one. That's chapter 10. Excuse me. <laughs> chapter 11 verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as ten chaste virgins to Christ. Are you reading your King James Bible? Pick it up, read it, please. You say, why are you being such a jerk about this? I'm not being a jerk. I'm trying to get you to realize this is your standard. You're going to be deceived if you aren't reading along in your Bible. It's very important. It does not say ten chaste virgins. Okay, it says a chaste virgin. The bride of Christ is one. Okay? One bride of Christ. Not ten. Jesus Christ is not a polygamist. All right, he is marrying a chaste virgin. Again, Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. You don't need to go any further than that to see it's not for us. The kingdom of heaven is the physical kingdom with the city of the great king Jerusalem ten virgins can't be to us I'm talking about Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble alright verse 2 and again remember chapter 24 that we just read there verses 42 through 51 talking about people looking for Jesus Christ there's no faith involved Matthew chapter 25 verse 2 and five of them were wise and five were foolish they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now the charismatics get all excited and they say, The oil is the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have enough of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to be left behind. Well, just back the truck up here for a minute. We just went past the stop sign. Okay, hold on. You know, back the oil truck up. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, well, why don't we look up in the Pauline epistles the word oil. Okay, the first time it appears, uh, well, actually, the last time it appears in the Gospels is Luke chapter 16, verse 6. And then it appears again in um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. And uh, James chapter 5, verse 14. And then Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. And chapter 18, verse 13. Uh, you mean to tell me Paul never writes about oil? Uh, that's correct. Now, um, if we're supposed to have enough oil to make sure that we get raptured, don't you think Paul would have mentioned it at least one time? But he never did. Why? Because it's not written to Christians. Am I getting through? <laughs> I certainly hope so. There's another problem. 
Verse 9 says, But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. That presents another big problem. Keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 25 and go to, to Acts, excuse me, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We're going to see how to buy the Holy Spirit. We're not really. I'm just being sarcastic. <laughs> Imagine that. Me sarcastic. That's terrible, isn't it? Acts chapter 8 verse 18. We'll start there. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Hey, that's a good thing according to the Charismatics. I mean, you know, I guess probably if you're trying to buy the Holy Ghost, that means you should be giving more money to the Charismatic Babel building that you're part of or to your favorite healer on TV that you watch, you know. <laughs> but he offers them money to buy the Holy Ghost. Now, according to the Charismatic interpretation of Matthew chapter 25, you should be able to buy oil, which is the oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, right? Let's see the reaction. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon, and said, Pray ye the Lord for me, that none of these things which he has spoken come upon me. Okay, well, uh, how does that work? Acts chapter 8. You get this guy saying, I'd like to buy the Holy Spirit, please. And Peter's just like, how dare you thy money perish with thee he just rebuking the guy like crazy but matthew chapter 25 says you're to go out and buy this oil if the oil is the holy spirit and we as christians are supposed to buy the holy spirit what uh what's peter doing rebuking simon we're in acts, acts chapter 8 that's a problem okay uh, no, the oil is not the Holy Spirit. And no, these ten virgins are not Christians. All right? Uh, when you're a Christian, you don't have some Holy Ghost pump someplace, some gas station of the Holy Spirit, oil station of the Holy Spirit, where you can go and you say, you know, I'm a little bit low in the Holy Spirit today. Could you give me five gallons, you know? I mean, it doesn't work that way. All right? When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. He doesn't come on you later like these demonic charismatic people teach, that you have to get saved and then you seek the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he starts speaking three in tongues and you start doing these wacky things. Uh-uh, that doesn't work. All right? The only thing that you can do as a Christian is get in and out of fellowship with the Lord. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There's never a time when you're a little bit low in the Holy Spirit. All right? And you've got to go out and buy more Holy Spirit so that you will be caught up with a rapture or something. Don't fall for that one. It's absolutely ridiculous. But we're going to go through some more verses here, so let's keep it moving. Got a bunch of scriptures to go through yet. But uh, verse 10, Matthew chapter 25, verse 10, we'll go back there. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. So wait. Here you have Holy Spirit sealed Christians, sealed with the, by the Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. And Jesus is shutting the door on them and saying, You didn't buy enough of the Holy Spirit. I don't know you anymore. <laughs> what? No. What do we have is Matthew chapter 24. The servants... The Jews that are there at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble who are no longer living by faith. Why? The mystery of God is finished. Revelation 10, verse 7. All right? They're not living under the system of faith. They see, they understand God is real. And all they got to do is just wait for Him to come back and stay in good works. That's what the oil is about. They're surviving. 
They're enduring to the end to be saved. Read Matthew chapter 20, verse 24, verse 13. It's all right there. You just have to rightly divide. There's a lot of people disobey and they make a mess of the Bible. Verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Notice it said day or hour. It does not say year or even month. But you see, by the time of the end of the, that end of the time of Jacob's trouble, um, by that time, I mean, the, the heavens are messed up, the, you know, the days are being shortened. I mean, it's going to be rough to understand even what time of the day it is. You know, I, I believe at the end, all the electricity is going to be wiped out. Uh, that's why they're, you know, the 200 million man army is on horseback. Uh, it's, it's going to be crazy by the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And they understand that God's there and all they're doing is just trying to do good works at that point in time. And we're going to see that as we continue here. Now let's look at verse 14. All right, here's another uh, kind of a parable, another thing that Jesus is trying to say to tell people that they're going to have to watch, that they're going to have to be doing good works. Now as we read down through these verses, I want you to point out to me, write down when you see the word faith or justified by faith or faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ or whatever. Okay? Make a note of it. Because, you know, people from now on are saved the same way, according to the non-dispensational cuckoo birds. No, they're not. Let's continue. Verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven, there we have it again, is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Okay, Jesus Christ went up to heaven and he's not coming back physically to the earth uh, before the second coming. When he comes for the Christians, it's in the clouds, we go up to meet him. But he doesn't touch down on the earth. Important distinction there. Verse 16, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Um, what's that talking about? Jesus Christ coming down at the judgment of the nations, which we're going to read here at the end of the passage here, at the end of this chapter, um, Matthew chapter 25, the judgment of the nations. He comes down and he judges these guys and he says, okay, you're going to have some rule here in the millennial kingdom. See, it all lines up. Uh, verse 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strolled. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Which kind of like invested it, in other words. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall he shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye that the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You say, well, Brother Ryan, this is for Christians. Talking about our service to the Lord. Oh, really? So, if you're faithful in your works, you get to go into the kingdom and rule with the Lord. But if you're not faithful, you get cast into outer darkness. You go to hell. 
So part of the body of Christ goes into the millennial kingdom, part goes down into hell. It's all based on works. I thought we're justified by faith. You see the problem people get into? Matthew chapter 25 is not written to Christians. It's written to Jews at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. The ten virgins are Jews. They're not the bride of Christ, the chaste virgin that marries Jesus. We're not going out and buying oil, the Holy Spirit, to make sure that we're ready for the rapture. Non-dispensationalism has caused... Uh, the vast majority of heresies and messed up things. Uh, that's why somebody that says I'm non-dispensational, I'll say, okay, uh, how long have you been saved? Do you understand the issue? And if they say, well, I've been saved all my, you know, for not all my life, but if I've, I've been saved for 20 years, 30 years, and I studied dispensationalism and it's just a heresy and they start attacking it, they're not saved. They are not saved. If somebody understands the dispensational arguments and still says I'm non-dispensational, you're looking at somebody who's lost. The Holy Spirit will never lead somebody to be a non-dispensationalist. Never. Mark it down. Never. You say, are you saying then that uh, being a dispensational uh, believer in dispensationalism, are you saying that that's necessary for salvation? I'm saying it's necessary after you get saved, God's going to get you to be a dispensationalist. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth, guide you into all truth. If you're non-dispensational, you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. And there might be somebody who's brand new, saved, just green, they don't understand the issue yet. Okay, fine, I'll have mercy. But uh, if they read about it and then come out and say, oh, I'm non-dispensational, dispensationalism is heresy, you're lost. Just as simple as that. But now we're going to read the last of the three different... Uh, stories okay the first two are basically jesus speaking symbolically especially the first one there the ten virgins he's speaking about um you know jews in the time of jacob's trouble all right the second one he's talking about jews there being faithful and things very similar to what's going on in matthew chapter 24 the last number of verses there but now here this is literal this is not figurative or well it's kind of this is literal this is what's going to happen uh after the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. All right? Now, what's the uh, prerequisite for Him to separate these sheep and the goats? You say, those that are justified by faith. And the finished work of Jesus Christ. Those are the sheep. The goats are those who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let's look for that. Okay? It's going to be there just like it was with the last, you know, the three servants there who we gave talents to. Because we saw they were justified by faith. Oh, that's right. Uh, no, they weren't. Works. Look at this. Verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Let's keep reading. Verse 35. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Wait a second. He just let people get into the millennial kingdom that did not have a profession of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus did not judge them one word about whether or not they believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. What's going on there? Are you listening? You want to write this down? Pencil? Paper? You ready? It's a different dispensation. You understand? 
Some of you don't. <laughs> Some people. It's a different dispensation. None of them are judged according to their faith. It's all works. Let's keep reading. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away, and go away, uh, and these shall go away. I'll get it out, into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Question: Why didn't any of them, they're the wicked. Why didn't any of them say, "Wait a second here, Jesus, listen. Hey, wait a second here." I've put my faith in your death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Okay? I'm washed in the blood. My sins are paid for. Why didn't any of them say that? It was all works. So what is the ten virgins about? The ten virgins are about Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's not one Scripture, one reference, one verse, one sentence, one word, one letter, one anything. Okay, dot, a drop of ink in Matthew chapter 25 that's doctrinally pointed at Christians. Not one. But uh, again, if you can use those passages to tell people that you've got to have enough oil, and, and if you don't have enough oil, you're probably not going to be raptured away. You're going to go through the time of Jacob. Well, they would say the Great Tribulation. See, they can control you. Um, fear is a great controlling mechanism of people. All right? Um, you know, when you get people that are saved, the Lord likens them to sheep. And uh, there's different ways to control sheep. But uh, the strongest way is through fear. All right? That's why wolves will go after them. Because a wolf knows if he comes running, growling and barking and making all kinds of noise, the sheep are going to go into a panic. They aren't going to all join together and say, whoa, let's fight this wolf off. They're going to just panic and run every which way, be tripping and falling and stumbling and things, and the wolf is going to have an easy time killing them. And you see, that's why the wolves, the false prophets come along. They'll use fear. They use fear tactics. They'll tell you that uh, you might not make it to the rapture. You might lose your salvation. You know, those are the things you're going to get. If you don't live a perfect, you know, righteous life, you're not going to keep salvation, you know, and things like this. That's what they're going to do. Watch out for the wolves. Okay? So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. I do thank you that... Uh, as Christians today, we do have your promises, your precious, uh, secure promises that we are a part of the body of Christ, we are your bride, and that uh, we will one day be caught up and we will meet you face to face. And uh, it's not that we get away with, with any kind of bad things that we want to do down here, Lord, because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll have to give an account of what we've done with our lives down here after we got saved. And uh, we're going to suffer loss when we have spent too much time with the flesh. But one thing we never have to worry about, Lord, is we never have to worry about uh, getting there and having you say, Depart from me, you, you that work iniquity, I never knew you. Um, we're not going to have to worry about that. But uh, for those people that are out there, Lord, that are listening to this and uh, they don't know you as their Savior and they're, they're gambling and saying that they can... Uh, they're going to wait till the rapture to see proof that the Bible's true, and then they'll get saved after that. Uh, they don't have the assurance that we do. Uh, there will be the ten virgins in the time of Jacob's trouble towards the end there where they're going to have to do good works and hope and pray that their works are good enough and that they won't lose their faith uh, as far as, uh, I shouldn't say faith, but they won't lose uh, hope 
so to speak, in uh, you coming back and taking them out. And uh, taking them out of Jerusalem and, and saving them, I should say it that way. And judging them at the judgment of the nations. So Lord, I do pray if there's any people that are not saved, that they would get saved. That they would realize that now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Uh, don't put it off any longer. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you would please keep your people safe. Uh, keep us all in your word, Lord. Help us not to listen to the false prophets out there and to, to really be able to discern these wicked people in these end times. And I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That is going to be it. Um, I thought to myself, you know, I'm just going to do two quick studies. But uh, after writing out the notes and things and looking at these arguments, you know, I understand that as we near the catching away of the Bride of Christ, um, more and more people are going to try to get fear into you so they can control you. Um, they're realizing that you're just about ready to leave as a Christian. And so they're, they're wanting that just that little bit more of just, i got to stop them. I don't want them to witness to people. I don't want them to have faith in this. Word of God, so I'll tell them it was changed by the Mandela effect. And I'll tell them that they probably don't have enough oil. They're going to have to endure to the end to be saved. And the preacher of rapture is all a lie. You're not escaping. You're going to go through. See what they're trying to do? They're trying to ensnare you. It's kind of like we're starting to, I mean, we're physically still on the earth, but it's kind of like when we're starting to go up to be with the Lord, if we would go up slow, which it's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but I'm just trying to make a point here. It's just like the lost world are trying to reach up and grab onto our ankles as we're going up and try to pull us back down to the earth. That's what they're trying to do right now. As we see, Jesus is coming. He's coming back for His bride. We're about ready to leave. You know, I've told this story before. I'm going to say it in closing. Uh, a number of years ago, when my wife and I met, um, I was in Pennsylvania. She was out in Iowa. And... Uh, there was a specific time when I was going to be coming out to, to get her. I drove out there and got her and her belongings and brought her back. And um, she didn't know the exact time when I was coming. But uh, as I got closer, I called her. And um, I told her, I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to be coming tonight or tomorrow. But, you know, I really wanted to see her. And so I ended up, it was like 18 hours of driving or something. No, maybe it was even more than that. I forget, but it was a crazy amount of driving. I was just like so tired. But I was driven from my love for my wife and wanting to see her. And she wanted to see me. And she was waiting there for me when I pulled in. She was ready to go. Are you ready to go to see Jesus Christ, Christian? Do you love Jesus? Are you in love with Him? Do you wake up sometimes and just think, Oh, Lord, please, today. <laughs> please, you know, get here. Please, Lord. Can we go today? Can you take us out of here today? <laughs> you should be. If your heart is on this world and you're saying, I hope He doesn't come back soon, your love is misplaced. Don't let the world take away your love for Jesus. Don't let the world blind you to the fact that He is going to be taking away His bride. And I believe it's going to be soon. Not much longer to go. So, let's stay active. Let's stay busy. Let's not let people destroy our faith and have us think, Oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I need to go by the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, you know, well, the I don't have the sign gifts. and, 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 and. Stand by the book. If you're saved, if you're born again, you're going up to meet your bridegroom. He loves you. He's not going to put you through a time where He's going to be pouring out wrath and judgment on the world. Just common sense here, folks. You don't need to be further purified. His blood washed away your sins. Simple. We go up. Bye-bye, world. If you're lost, you get to stay down here. And as I said in the last study, 
you're going to face this one. You're not facing the lamb. You're facing the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's angry. So I'm going to need to see the proof. Okay. Go ahead. I don't want to see proof. I've seen enough. So that's going to be it. We thank you very much to everybody out there who prays for the ministry. And uh, we pray uh, for you. Uh, I can't possibly pray by, for everybody by name. Um, there's been so many people I've forgotten, people that have contacted me over the years. I get emails from people sometimes. Hey, Brother Brian, do you remember me? And I'm just like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so many thousands of people now. It's just such a blessing from the Lord. I just, But it's like my poor little puny brain can't remember everybody. But uh, I pray for certain people in, by name that I know what's going on with the prayer requests and things. But uh, all of you, I pray for my viewers every single day. I pray for you all that, uh, that you'd stay away from the false prophets and you'd stand by the book. And that's going to be the prayer I'm going to pray up until the rapture. Please do the same for us. Thank you for watching.